Hey everyone, welcome back to Simming History, where we look at the history of architecture through the lens of The Sims. Before we get started today, if you like the video, please take a moment to hit like and subscribe. It helps out the channel. Today we start a mini-series on World Fair Architecture, a subscriber request, and we are starting with the Great Exhibition of 1851 and its central building, the Crystal Palace. World's fairs have actually had a pretty large impact on the history of architecture, and hopefully we'll see that throughout the course of this series. But today we're going to talk about more about where it started. Industry exhibitions began in post-revolution France in 1801 in a bid to counteract economic depression. England held similar exhibitions in the early 1800s, but by the late 1840s, an idea had taken hold in England that there needed to be not just a national, but an international or world exhibition. First put forward by English industry design enthusiast Henry Cole, he was later joined by Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's consort, and they sought to hold what would be called the Great Exhibition. They hoped to open it in 1851 and a site that would eventually be determined to be Hyde Park in London. Eventually, they convinced the government to support the notion, largely by promising it would be self-funded. The exhibition could also serve as a great point of British pride by throwing a better exhibition than the French did in 1844. And so, the building committee began to seek design proposals for the exhibit building. And in this search, they really weren't all that successful. They received nearly 250 submissions, including international designers, but only two really stood out, both buildings of steel and glass. One designed by a French architect and one designed by a British architect. But their price tags both exceeded their limited budget, and they could not guarantee it would be, would be built in time. By this point, opening day of the fair was only about a year away, so the committee began plans of their own a simple square brick building with a dome, which would also probably not have been completed on time. Thankfully for all of us in architecture history, one of the committee members knew of this gardener who had overseen the construction of a couple of greenhouses and asked him to submit a design. The man's name was Joseph Paxton, and he submitted his design sketched on pink blotter paper and it was immediately approved because the estimated cost of 150,000 pounds, roughly 17 million today, was half that of their maximum budget. And because it could be built in less than a year's time. His design made use of regulated iron components that could be easily mass produced, as well as a recent development of plate glass, allowing that to also be mass produced. And for those reasons, he could guarantee it would be constructed in time. Sections would arrive on site pre-assembled, and then they were connected together. In its construction, there were 3,800 tons of cast iron, 700 tons of wrought iron, 24 miles of gutters, and 900,000 square feet of plate glass. The whole structure was supported with steel tension cables, which allowed the exterior components to be lighter and airier in appearance. The exhibit building was 1,848 feet long, 408 feet wide, had an interior height of 128 feet, and its 990,000 square feet of exhibit space was spread out over two levels, with the second flo floor accessible by eight staircases, two in each corner. For the comfort of the guests, there were also toilets for gents and ladies, and this played a slight role in normalizing the use of public toilets in Britain. The main center aisles were multi-story, allowing for fountains, large statues, ceremony platforms, and the old growth trees in Hyde Park to remain in place while the palace was built around them. Once opened, it was dubbed the Crystal Palace by the press for the way it glittered in the sun. According to the British Library, over 100,000 objects were displayed on over 10 miles of exhibit space by more than 15,000 contributors, and Britain, as the host, occupied half of the display area. On display were objects such as hydraulic presses, rugs, ceramics, a printing press, pianos, 
adding machines, which were entirely new, steam engines, agricultural equipment, furniture, statues, gold, diamonds, watches, the list goes on. Every country brought their own goods to display. I tried to outfit a few areas in the build, but at this point there were so many objects in the game that the game was actually starting to struggle to cope, which is why you're going to start seeing some things getting added off camera. The contradiction of the industrialized exterior of the building and the largely craft-based displays appealed to both the industrialists, who thought this showed the future, and the supporters of the arts and crafts movement, who lamented the, the decline of crafts in Britain. The fair would be only open for six months, but in that time, over six million people walked through the doors of the Crystal Palace, equivalent to about a third of the British population at the time. Queen Victoria and Prince Albert were present for opening and closing ceremonies, and Queen Victoria visited the fair at least 34 times. At the end, the Crystal Palace was dismantled and moved to Sydenham, where it housed other concerts and festivals, before sadly burning down in 1936. And the self-funding fair? Well, it earned a profit of about £186,000. Now remember, 150,000 would be a roughly 17 million today. So 186,000 pounds, that's a good lot of money. It eventually resulted in the founding of an arts area in London, such as the what is known today as the Victoria and Albert Museum, and investing in scientific research in Britain even today. The fair itself is considered the first real world fair, and its success defined world's fairs for the next 100 years, ultimately having a huge impact on architecture. Thanks for joining me today as we took a look at the Crystal Palace and the Great Exhibition of 1851. Next time, we continue our world's fair tour. A Perry. Until then, you can find me on Instagram at Simming History and on the Sims 4 Gallery at Simming History, where there will be playable versions of this and many other builds. Thank you to all the new subs. If you haven't yet, hit subscribe. When we hit a thousand, I will do a live build. So subscribe and share. I'll see you all next time. Until then, bye!